Hi, and welcome to Helping Those Who Care. This webinar is created and presented by Kate Mosley, an AT Specialist with TASC, and Brittany Lively, the Training and Resource Specialist with Alabama Respite. Participants in this webinar will understand the importance of respite and how to locate natural supports, and understand assistive technology and how it can help both caregivers and care recipients. To begin, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Brittany Lively and I'm the Training and Resource Specialist with Alabama Respite. I've been with Alabama Respite for one year now and previous to this position expanded my knowledge base in the social work field. Our mission is working to make respite readily accessible and available to all caregivers in Alabama. Today I will be speaking to you about caregiving as well as respite and finding natural supports in your community. When you think of a caregiver, what comes to mind? Who is a caregiver? Alabama Respite has defined a caregiver as anyone providing unpaid care at home to a spouse, child, relative, or friend of any age who has a disability or chronic illness, or needs help with activities of daily living. Now let's talk about the R word. Oftentimes, when asked to pronounce this word, we are presented with a variety of pronunciations. The correct way of saying it is respite. Respite is a temporary relief for family caregivers who are caring for individuals of any age who have disabilities and or a chronic or terminal illness. All in all, respite is a temporary break for the caregiver to take rest. So now that we have discussed what respite is, let's watch a short video to further explain.
Respite is important for many reasons, in which we will discuss soon, but for now I'd like everyone to grab a piece of paper and something to write with. We are going to brainstorm. I would like for you to take five minutes and jot down as many ideas as you can in relation to the question, why is respite important to you as a caregiver? You may begin now.
Let's discuss a few additional reasons why respite is so important for the caregiver. Respite can reduce stress and fatigue. By taking a short break, it allows the caregiver to experience a refresh period and gather their thoughts. Respite improves family functioning and satisfaction with life. Simple, consistent breaks prove to be beneficial to the caregiver. By taking respite, our attitudes will greatly improve toward the one who we are providing care to. Respite helps sustain the caregiver's health and well-being as well. It can also delay and avoid out-of-home placements, which is what we typically want. We all want to keep our loved ones with us as long as possible. Lastly, I'd like to point out respite will redu reduce the likelihood of abuse and neglect. We hear of these cases more often than we would like and is usually directly related to caregiver burnout. As a caregiver, it is important to know what natural supports are available in your community and where to locate them. I would like to begin by defining natural supports. Natural supports, in simplest terms, are those respite options found within your specific community. It is important to realize natural supports may or may not be the same in someone else's community as they are your own. Natural supports can be difficult in the beginning, but may be one of your best resources if you work hard to establish and maintain them. Some of the typical respite providers are private pay individuals, adult daycares, family members, and home health agencies. But today I'd like to focus on locating natural supports. Natural supports include school or day programs, your faith community, social media, your local universities, hobby groups, and support groups. Now we are going to move along to the reality of it all. Sometimes finances might be tight or we may live in a rural area. Caregivers oftentimes find themselves with no one to call on. They may be estranged from family or finding natural supports is just too hard and time consuming. If we are being realistic, we realize respite away from the home is not always possible and some would even say it's impossible due to the situation they are given. It is time for another brainstorm, so grab those writing utensils and paper. I want you to take a few minutes and think about your situation and jot down a few ideas on what respite options would work best for you in your current situation.
Believe it or not, you can still enjoy a form of respite without leaving the home. Several options could include exercising, relaxation or distraction techniques, meditating in a quiet room, even if that room is the bathroom. You can also experience respite by keeping a gratitude journal. It is important to remember those things you are thankful for each day and, journal, and the journal can serve as a daily reminder. This journal can also be in the form of promises to yourself and a checklist of the things that make you happy. Let's get ready to do our final brainstorm. I want you to list an example of each of the following while making sure to keep in mind to modify them to your needs and I will do the same. An example of physical activity for me would be walking in place for 20 minutes. Now it's your turn. Give an example of a physical activity or exercise that you can do in a short amount of time. A good relaxation technique for me would be listening to a soothing sound CD. It could be nature or classical music. There are so many options for finding a good relaxation technique and Google happens to be my favorite. So what is one that you like? A distraction technique I use frequently is coming up with a different animal for each letter of the alphabet. Distraction techniques are most beneficial for me when I'm stressed out or frustrated about my day. Next, we see meditation. Yoga is a good tool to utilize for some good meditating. What I love most about yoga is there are beginner, intermediate, and even difficult levels that can be modified just for you. Journaling is something I do as an escape. It helps me put things in perspective and allows me to reflect on what I am doing versus what I should be doing. It serves as a wonderful reminder of the things I am thankful for as well. So what is one thing that you could do in a journal?
So now let us talk about assistive technology. My name is Kate Mosley and I'm an assistive technology for TASC. We will start by asking the question, how can you better manage your life as a caregiver? Life can be difficult to manage. Between the care recipient and your own day-to-day -day needs and projects, it can be difficult to keep track. Doctor's appointments, medication, hygiene needs, feeding, and activities can become overwhelming and lead to stress. So make technology work for you. Technology can be anything from software, like apps for Android or iPhone, tools, like weighted utensils, or electronic devices, like voice commanded TV remotes. The purpose of these technologies are to aid caregivers or care recipients with tasks. You might start by asking yourself, what tasks do you or your care recipient struggle with? There might be an app for that. Now you might be asking yourself, what is assistive technology? Assistive technology, or AT, is described by the AITA as any item, piece of equipment, or software or product system that is used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. In short, AT levels the playing field for individuals with disabilities. While some of us might not think twice about picking up the phone and making a call, someone without hands might need an alternative way of answering calls. Assistive technology would provide them with tools or devices so they can perform the task themselves. There are three different categories of technology, high-tech, medium-tech, and no-tech. High-tech would be any device that uses batteries, has a screen, or needs to be charged. For example, a computer with special voice-activated software would be an example of high technology. Medium technology are devices that you would not be able to build yourself, but that are simple in design, such as a special computer mouse. No-tech devices do not use wires, batteries, or screens. An example of a low-tech device would be a weighted spoon for someone who might have tremors. There are also devices that can be labeled as universal design, and we will talk about that on the next slide. So here are some examples of different ways to ask for the same apple. I could use sign language, like the little girl up in the top left, or point to the physical apple on the counter. If the apple is not in sight, I could point to a picture in the book. The book would be an example of a low-tech device. The medium-tech device is a button that, when pressed, speaks a recorded message, such as, I would like an apple, please. Last but definitely not least is a communication device. This special computer is designed for people who cannot use their own voice and assists them in creating sentences that are spoken aloud by the computer. This is an example of a high-tech device. AT and UD, making the world accessible for all. So we have learned that AT stands for assistive technology and that it is any device or tool to help individuals with any disability perform a function. We have also learned that these devices level the playing field in both the workforce and at home. Some examples of AT include braille, wheelchairs, and blind canes. These devices are not regularly used by people without disabilities. Now let's talk about UD, or Universal Design. Universal Design is any device that helps people without disabilities and people with disabilities. These are ideal devices. An example of a Universal Design product that you've come in contact with is an elevator. As an individual without a disability, I use an elevator to get to the 50th floor of a building instead of walking up 50 flights of stairs. Someone in a wheelchair might also use an elevator to get to the 50th floor. The elevator is accessible and used by everyone in the building, and because of its universal access, we say it has universal design. So how does AT help you as a caregiver? It is important to remember that technology does not cure a disability. 
or take away all the difficulties. There's probably not one device that will aid all of your needs. These devices either aid the caregiver with a task or help the care recipient with a task that allows them to be more independent. To start figuring out what technology would work best for you and your care recipient, we would ask the recipient, what activities would you like to be more independent with? They may respond with eating, bathing, or maybe controlling their environment, such as turning the lights on or off, or turning fans on and off. After we know what activity they would like to be more independent with, we will want to know what specific tasks they need assistance with. If they would like help with bathing, bathing we need to know if they want help brushing their teeth, or getting into the tub, or washing their back. Now we can start looking for a device. It is important to remember that the more independence the care recipient has is less that the caregiver will have to perform. So let's brainstorm. What tasks do you or your care recipient struggle with? Which tasks would you like to be more independent with? Take five minutes to make a list of ideas.
Now I am going to list a few examples of devices in each category. As I mentioned earlier, if there is a task that you or a loved one is having difficulty performing, there may be a device to assist you. I will demo some of these devices after I've explained the different categories. Reminders, feeding and drinking, bathing, dressing, and entertainment. I will start with reminders and alerts. Devices in this category are very helpful for the caregiver. If you are responsible for medication and appointment reminders, these devices are for you. There are many devices for reminders. Apps like MetaSafe for the iPhone and Android, electronic calendars like the one you use on your computer or phone, alarm clocks like the one at the bottom left here, or pill cases that set alarms like the one in the upper right hand corner. All of these products will have the same function. It just depends on what system works best for you. It is also important to have an alert system. If your loved one cannot raise their voice or signal when they need assistance, baby monitors or adapted door chimes may be beneficial for alerting the caregiver when assistance is needed. Let's move on to feeding and drinks. Feeding and drinking can be a difficult part to assist with. If an individual with a disability can be independent for longer, it can remove some of the stress the caregiver would face every day. To aid with drinking, you can create your, extra long, your own extra long straws. You can buy clear tubing like the one seen here and link the tubing from a thermos on the back of a wheelchair or from a cup on a table. Water bottles are also great alternatives to open cups. If your loved one has enough motor skills to drink out of an open cup, they may benefit from a nosy cup, like the one seen here. This cup leaves room for your nose so that you do not have to tilt your head back, or maybe they can benefit from putting grips on the cup using rubber bands. Even if the care recipient has tremors or has lost some of their fine motor skills, they can still feed themselves. There are barriers that attach to plates, like in the upper right hand corner, to make it easier to scoop up food or plates that have lipped edges that have a similar function. Adapted utensils can be anything from weighted utensils for more control like the ones seen at the bottom here. Cuffed utensils for those with less fine motor skills and ability to pick up utensils or even utensils that are bent for easier access, like here at the bottom. Communication is extremely important. Similar to the alert devices we had talked about earlier, these devices are used to express needs, ideas, and feelings. There are do-it-yourself options for communication, which are called communication boards, like the one seen at the bottom right here. These communication boards will have one statement pictures or graphics on a card that users can use their eyes or hands to point at. I will discuss ways to make communication boards easily and accessible later on. Devices like the step-by-step, -step, as seen here, have different recordings that the user can save. Yes, no, and I need to go to the bathroom are some great phrases that most users would like to have available. Recorders, like the colorful 10 second recorders you see in the upper right hand corner, are great for easy access to simple phrases. The green button, for example, may say yes please, where the red might say no thank you. These, are easy, these easy to record buttons are portable and easy to use. They also come in many bright colors so the user can easily distinguish between them. Another great communication device would be the amplification systems. Some users may not have a very powerful voice and speaking up might get very tiring very quickly. Using an amplification system so they can be heard at a comfortable level without having to raise their voice can be very useful. These systems can be easily attached to the front of wheelchairs or on the side of a bedside table. Bathing can be difficult for both the caregiver and the care recipient. There are many great products for use in the bathroom that can give the user some much needed independence. 
Grab bars are a great start. Most OTs recommend that grab bars are securely fastened into the walls, like the grab bar shown here at the bottom right. This decorative toilet paper holder is actually a grab bar to assist with standing and sitting on the toilet. There are grab bars that suction to the bathroom wall, but they are to be used with caution and supervision, like the one seen here. Non-slip mats are easy to find at any Walmart or Target and allow the user to get a grip with their feet. If standing in the shower is not an option, shower chairs can be found at most drugstores or supermarkets and allow the user to bathe while sitting. These chairs are also useful when transferring from wheelchairs to showers. Bedside commodes, or portable toilets, are not just for use in the bedroom, but for the bathroom as well. These commodes can raise the height of the toilet seat so the user can easily sit and stand up. There are many clients who may have difficulty turning knobs at home. There are knob extenders, like the blue and red handles here at the top, that allow users to turn small knobs with a lot less force. These extenders are especially useful with arthritis. If the user is still experiencing pain from turning or squeezing objects, look into an automatic dispenser. In the upper right hand corner, we see an automatic toothpaste dispenser, but there are also dispensers for soap, shampoo, and conditioner. Drop preventatives are also very important because many users may fall from bending down or slip on fallen items. Putting a bar of soap in a pair of pantyhose tied to the shower head allows the user to access the soap without ever having to bend down to pick it up. This is one inexpensive solution to a bigger problem. Probably everyone's least favorite bathing activity is wiping, but this can be very difficult for some caregivers. The wiper in the bottom left hand corner here allows the user to wipe themselves without having to reach or turn. The extended handle and length is perfect for reaching areas that may be difficult to access. After we bathe, we get dressed. Dressing someone else can be very difficult, so let them be as independent as possible with these devices. First, there are sock aids. Sock aids can be a roller, like the one in the bottom corner here, or a pull-up that slips the sock under your foot. Both types of aids are useful, but get whichever one works best for you. Bracelet clips are wonderful for any user. These clips allow anyone an easy alternative to putting on the tricky jewelry by holding the clamp for you. There is an example of one right here. Bra and underwear assists are wonderful for care recipients that might feel uncomfortable with others helping them with their undergarments. These devices are here in the middle and help with inserting your legs or holding clasps of undergarments for easy access. Button and zipper pulls are useful devices that allow the user to easily pull a button through the eyelet or to pull zippers even if they have limited access to fine motor skills. These devices usually come in one tool as shown in the upper right hand corner here. The hook at one end laces through the zipper and gives you an extra handle. The other end is used to hook buttons. Last but not least, if you enjoy sewing, most shirts with buttons can be replaced with magnets. Here at the bottom right, we see a normal looking shirt with magnets hidden under the buttons to easily put on and remove the shirt. Our last category is entertainment. Everyone wants access to the things they enjoy, so here are some ways to give your care recipient access to what they enjoy most. Let's start with the TV. Turn the volume up and down and changing the channels can get tiresome, so give the care recipient access to the remote with a universal large button remote like the one in the left corner, here. Or a voice activated remote like the one in the picture in the middle. Care recipients can also access the computer by using rollerball mice instead of traditional mice or trackers like the natural point which uses a silver tracking dot that you can place on hats or glasses. 
By placing the silver tracking dot near the face, users can control the mouse with just the movement of their head. I will now demonstrate a few of these devices. Some of the devices I had listed can get kind of pricey. In some situations, you can actually make the device yourself. The next few slides are devices that you can make with everyday items you may find around the house. Sometimes a little tweaking to what you already have can make all the difference. To start, we have a paper clip that can hold a bracelet in place when it is being fastened. We also have the magnetic buttons I had mentioned earlier. Just by sewing magnets under the buttons, we are able to create a shirt that is easier to use. Next to the shirt, we have our own homemade button hook and zipper pull. The button hook is made with duct tape and a paper clip. Simply place the button in the pull, pull hole and then pull it through the button eyelet. The zipper pull is made from a simple keychain ring. After you zip up your pants, you can loop the ring around the pants button. Here it stays hidden and keeps the zipper held up. On this next page, we have a few more ideas, including rubber bands to provide more grip on a cup, rough tape to provide some extra footing in slippery or steep places, and a piece of paper over a remote for buttons that we do not need. Remotes nowadays can do just about anything, and that can actually be overwhelming for some people. By covering up the unnecessary buttons, we can not only give them a better view of what they need, but not overwhelm them as well. Our last page, we have quite a few ideas. To start, someone cut a sliver of a pool noodle and then cut room to slip in some cards, here. For someone with low motor function, this could be a game changer. There are also inexpensive solutions, such as the soap in the stocking we had mentioned earlier, using alligator clip rope as a napkin holder, using rubber adhesive bumps to distinguish phone buttons, and using foam rollers on handles or utensils for grip. In the last photo, we have someone using suguru putty to assist in opening medicine tops, gluing a straw to a paper clip for holding the straw in place, using a clothes hanger to hold open books, and using shelf liners as non-slip grips. Again, it is important to note that some of these do-it-yourself ideas may work for you, it might not work for others. It is important to have a trial period to see what best fits you and your care recipient's needs. If you have any questions about how to make these items, please email me at tasc at ucphuntsville.org. Now I'm going to demo a few of these items. Okay, so first let's talk about eating. Here I have three tools for eating. I have my lift plate. So as you can see, the rim of this plate is a lot higher than in most. This is really wonderful for scooping things onto your utensils, such as peas or carrots. Unfortunately, you can't feel the weight of this fork, but this fork is significantly heavier than most utensils. So, as a quick demo, you would simply scoop and the lip would help you move things onto the fork. Some individuals have difficulty tilting their head back. They might not have the neck movement or it might be painful for them. This is called a nosy cup. So, as you can see, there's a divot within the cup. This helps make room for someone's nose. So, instead of tilting their head back, they can tilt the cup. Next, let's talk about dressing and health. So I have here a shirt that needs to be buttoned. This is a button hook. I had talked about this earlier on in the presentation. This first end is for zippers. So we'd loop this little hook through the zipper and pull up. This is a lot easier than pinching those small zipper pulls. This one gives you a lot more motion and a bigger handle. So we have our unbuttoned shirt here. This is the button hook end of this button hook. So to do so, we're going to lace it through the eyelet, put our button in the button hook, and then simply pull through. And our shirt is now buttoned. For health, we have the Apex Pill Turtle. 
So this pill turtle is really great because it labels the days of the week. It also allows for four alarms. So during the day, if you need to take pills in the morning for lunch, at night, and maybe around midnight, it will set alarms so that you're aware that it's time to take your medication. It also leaves room for storing pills. So you can put your pills right in there and then close it. So you know it's Friday and the alarm goes off, you need to take Friday's pills. This is really great if you alternate days. So if you only take pills on Saturday, Thursday, Tuesday, and Sunday, you can set it up that way or however you like. Now let's talk about reachers. This is probably my favorite device in our lending library. This is the Telestick. The Telestick is like most reachers in that you can reach for something far away. This is probably your basic reacher. You've seen one of these, I'm sure. It helps you reach something that might have fallen or gotten behind something where it's difficult to fit your arm. It has a simple clasp and a trigger. This device is special in that it picks up items that might not be able to be picked up through that clamp hand. This first head is very sticky. It's great for picking up books and paper and even money if it's dropped. This second head is magnetic. It can actually hold something as heavy as car keys. So no matter how many keychains or different kind of keys you have on your key ring, this magnet will be able to hold it. You'll also notice that it has a telescoping head, so it can easily fit in your purse while still being able to reach those faraway objects. Now, communication is extremely important. As I had mentioned earlier in the presentation, this is a way for someone to express their feelings, needs, and ideas. I have two recorders here today. I have this Big Talk, which is going to record multiple recordings, and by pressing the button, it'll speak back what you've recorded. So this would be great for saying, you know, yes, please, or no, thank you, or I need to go to the bathroom. Those are three phrases that usually people want to say. So you have this big one, which you'd put on a table so it wouldn't slip. But then you also have smaller 10 second recorders like the one seen here. This small recorder, as I said, will only record about 10 seconds, but it's great for having short, you know, please ask me yes or no questions so that they can then respond yes or no. These also come in many different colors. So maybe the red one means no, the green one means yes, and you can differentiate between what communication you would actually like to say. You also heard me talk about computer and TV access. This is an extra large remote. You'll notice that the buttons are extremely large, but you'll also notice that there are not a lot of buttons that people don't need on this remote. So you might not need a Netflix button if you don't know what Netflix is. You might not need a TiVo button or a TV guide. What you might need is a simple one that shows volume, control, and allows you to type in what channel you'd like to view. So not only is this remote extra large, but it's simple and it's going to take away all those unnecessary buttons that can overwhelm people. I also have this trackball mouse. So this mouse is unlike most mouses in that you don't move it around, but you move this little ball instead. So this little ball is easy to move around and you only use your fingers. So if you have someone who gets a lot of pain from moving their arm around or that might get exhausting really easily, this is a great solution because it easily moves around with your, just your finger. So now let's talk a little bit about our programs, Respite, Task, and Star. As you can see, there is more information on www.alabamarespite.org. And if you have any further questions, you can reach us at 1-866-737-8252. I have provided a list of our services and would like to give some additional information regarding each. We will begin with information and referral. Alabama Respite tries to make it our business to know what other agencies across the state are doing and what resources are available to caregivers and their loved ones. If our agency can't assist the caregiver, we will refer them to one that can. Secondly, you see public awareness and advocacy. A big part of our job is to let as many people in the state know who we are, what we do, and who we serve. 
We are in Montgomery quite often advocating for caregivers statewide and stressing the need for services to exist. Thirdly, you will notice voucher respite programs. We currently administer four voucher programs. The first one I'd like to speak about is emergency respite. This program is for any caregiver that finds themselves in an emergency situation, sickness, hospitalization, etc. Secondly, we offer a training voucher that allows the caregiver to be reimbursed for taking respite after attending a two-hour training that Alabama Respite speaks at. Next, we have a contract with the Department of Mental Health that provides a voucher to those caregivers caring for someone with an intellectual disability, or an IQ below 70. Lastly, I will speak on the HEARTS program. We have a contract through Children's Trust Fund that provides those caring for an individual under the age of 19 who have a developmental delay with a respite voucher. It is important to note that all vouchers act as a reimbursement, meaning the respite services must be provided before payment is distributed. Also, funds are limited and change depending on current funding. Next you see technical assistance, which includes helping start respite programs in churches and training volunteers. We also make referrals. Sharing the Care is a project of Alabama Respite that includes members in the community whose goal is to strengthen caregivers by increasing respite resources. We also do free volunteer trainings, so if there is a topic requested, we can provide any church or nonprofit with that training. And if we aren't the professional in the area, we will find them. So what can Task and Star do for me? TASC does AT consultations, trainings, and technical assistance. TASC partners with STAR to provide a lending library that services all of Alabama. You can view this library at al.atforall.com. We also have a website, www.startraining.org, where you can look at modules with links and resources to all kinds of assistive technology. We also are available on Pinterest, Twitter, and Facebook for updates about events going on with both of these programs. If you have any additional questions about these program or have any questions about this webinar, please contact us at 256-859-4900. You can contact Brittany Lively at blively at ucphuntsville.org for respite information and Kate Mosley at task at ucphuntsville.org for task information. Thank you very much for listening to this webinar.